Hello, my name is Lisa Curtis, and I'm the Director of Indo-Pacific Security here at the Center for a New American Security. Thank you for joining us today for the launch of our new report, Forging a New Era of U.S.-Japan-South Korea Trilateral Cooperation, the Key to a Stable, Secure Indo-Pacific. Last August, President Biden hosted a historical trilateral summit at Camp David leaders of Japan and South Korea to deepen and expand their trilateral collaboration. The meeting resulted in a comprehensive joint statement called the Spirit of Camp David, which commits the three nations to increasing the frequency of their consultations, collaborating on economic security measures and the protection of emerging technologies, raising the tempo and sophistication of their joint military exercises, and taking new initiatives such as sharing sensitive missile warning data on North Korea in real time. The meeting has raised hopes for a new era in trilateral cooperation that could help address nuclear and missile threats from North Korea and contribute to deterrence, stability, and economic prosperity throughout the Indo-Pacific region. To tell us more about these developments and the report itself, we have two CNAS experts. First is Evan Wright. He's a research assistant for the Indo-Pacific Security Program at CNAS. He focuses on U.S. Indo-Pacific relations, East Asian security, and science and technology policy. He is also a non-resident fellow at the Johns Hopkins Seiss Reischauer Center for East Asian Studies, and he's also a young Pacific Forum leader. He previously worked as a science policy fellow with the Institute for Defense Analyses, where he conducted research on space policy, artificial intelligence, and other critical and emerging technologies. Next, we'll have Hannah Kelly, who is a research associate with the Technology and National Security Program at CNAS. Her work focuses on U.S. national technology strategy and international cooperation on responsible technology use. Hannah also helps run the CNAS Task Force on Biotechnology and American Competitiveness. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Evan. Evan, over to you. Thanks so much, Lisa. It's a great privilege today to speak with you and the other panelists about this really important topic. Uh, today, I'm going to cover primarily the diplomatic and defense aspects of the report, and then I'll turn it over to my colleague Hannah here to talk about the technological aspects. So just to talk a bit about where we've been uh, and where we're going, uh, looking specifically at diplomacy, uh, this really comes back to uh, the rapprochement that we've been seeing recently between Japan and South Korea, starting in uh, early 2022 with the election of President Yoon suk yeol uh, If we go back a few years even to 2018 and 2019, relations between Japan and South Korea were uh, pretty tense. Uh, there were a lot of issues both on the ec uh, economic, uh, diplomatic, and, and defense fronts that weren't working particularly well. Uh, but uh, President Yoon really took the reins on this relationship to try to warm relations and bring Tokyo and Seoul closer together. Uh, and so over the course of about a year, uh, especially during 2023, uh, he really tried to work on bilateral relations. Uh, Prime Minister Kishida from Japan also worked with him quite closely on this. And we saw a serious warming of relations between the two countries. And this essentially set the foundation uh, for uh, what we've seen here, uh, like Lisa mentioned uh, last year with the Camp David summit in August of 2023. The Biden administration saw the thawing in relations between Seoul and Tokyo, uh, and they took this opportunity to really reset trilateral relations between the three countries. Uh, and this, this Camp David summit was uh, truly a, a watershed moment here. It was, it was a reset for the relationship and, as Lisa mentioned, uh, essentially expanded the agenda for the trilateral relationship beyond the traditional North Korean missile and nuclear threat that was typically associated with this particular partnership. Uh, since then, there's been some serious diplomatic engagement and very frequent diplomatic engagement. Uh, over 30 meetings have taken place since August of last year, averaging about one every four days, which is a, a very fast clip for uh, such a monumental task of this kind. Um, but diplomacy isn't the only thing that's really informed the closer ties between the three countries. Uh, the increasingly secure and uh, security environments of uh, East Asia has been uh, a big factor in this. Uh, North Korea continues to be a, a serious uh, threat, both from a, a missiles perspective and a nukes perspective. And of course, there's always the uh, Russian invasion of new, uh, Ukraine, as well as uh, increased maritime aggression and the South China and East China Sea from Ch uh, China, as well as 
uh, economic coercion and uh, increased technological competition. So this is essentially uh, an increase in tensions across all fronts uh, that have really driven these three players together, both on the diplomatic fronts and the defense uh, fronts. And just a few uh, highlights here, uh, indicating some of the, the closer defense cooperation here. As Lisa mentioned, we have an increasingly new uh, share a real-time missile warning sharing system between the three countries that was set up as of December of last year. Uh, this is a, a new uh, effort, uh, and it will make it much easier for the three countries to coordinate when tracking these missile launches from North Korea. Uh, we've also seen uh, not one, but two uh, aerial trilateral exercises, which were a first for the three countries, where we have uh, US, Japanese, and South Korean aircraft flying together uh, for these exercises. Uh, these are both political signals and a great uh, example of closer military cooperation. Uh, and then we have increased naval exercises as well uh, across uh, multiple areas of effort, uh, including interdiction exercises, counter piracy, many of these different areas. So uh, we're seeing uh, much closer defense cooperation between the three countries. And I think there's reason to be optimistic that this will only get closer as time goes on. Uh, now, in terms of how the relationship can move forward here, there are, of course, some hurdles that need to be addressed. Uh, leadership change in any of the three countries uh, could uh, slow down the, the momentum that we've seen from Camp David, but uh, I think there's still reason to be optimistic that if we continue to see these uh, meetings and these defense exercises regularized, that it may be able to sort of weather the storm, uh, no matter what leadership we have in each of the three capitals. Um, additionally, uh, there are uh, varying threat perceptions between the three countries, naturally, as a result of geography. Um, but as long as we continue to see this dialogue between Seoul, Tokyo, and Washington, and there's an understanding of these, these variances in threat perceptions, I think there's reason to be optimistic that we will continue to see them to work on these issues, even if there isn't necessarily uh, coordination directly on, on how much of a threat each of these different aspects of, of the security environment are. So with that in mind, just a few recommendations from our report related to diplomacy and defense here. Uh, one, uh, considering how ambitious the U.S. agenda is for the Indo-Pacific as it relates to many lateral initiatives, particularly the, the U.S.-Japan ROK trilateral, uh, we recommend in the report uh, creating an interagency working group to identify opportunities and gaps in coordination across all these various uh, many lateral initiatives. Um, similar efforts have already been started in the U.S. Department of State but a larger interagency group of this kind could help to really synergize all these different efforts across various fronts, especially considering how large the Indo-Pacific is. And then additionally, uh, one of the outcomes of Camp David is closer uh, trilateral uh, military exercises and, and, and planning. Um, as part of this, of course, traditional domains will be a main focus, maritime security, things of this nature. Uh, but we recommend in the report, uh, including uh, exercises on cyber and space as part of this effort as well, just because these will become increasingly important domains. Uh, so there's a lot of progress that we've seen uh, diplomatically uh, on the defense front, uh, but there's a lot more to be seen on the tech front as well. And so with that, I'll, I'll pass it along to my uh, colleague, Hannah Kelly. Yes, it's great to be here today um, uh, alongside my co-authors and our incredible speakers that will join later on. Um, in addition to the North Korea threat that's driving this diplomatic and defense cooperation, as Evan mentioned, um, technology and economic cooperation between the states has also been spurred in great part by growing competition with and then also often in tandem economic coercion from China. Chinese advancements in critical and emerging technologies threaten um, longstanding U.S. ROK and Japanese leadership in critical and emerging technologies, um, which is critical for advancing, as we mentioned in the report, intelligence capabilities, building leading edge defense equipment, um, fostering economic growth, just how uh, given how closely tied technology leadership and economic competition are, are interrelated and then cementing um, democratic technology norms and standards. So deciding what the rules of the road are gonna be for these emerging technologies and ensuring that they are underpinned by democratic principles. Um, and so this shared threat perception when it comes to global technology leadership and what it might mean for China to take the helm has played a massive role in expediting some of these conversations. Specifically on the technology front, the leaders following the Camp David summit 
called for increased collaboration across a range of areas, including semiconductors and batteries, um, but also biotech, AI, quantum computing, um, as Evan mentioned, space security, um, and then also this acceleration of the green energy transition and some uh, increased mobilization of financing towards supply chain resiliency uh, writ large. Um, and so this historic summit and the three states um, have really spurred uh, an increase in a cadence of meetings, as Evan mentioned. Um, there's been a number of uh, vice ministerial meetings specifically to discuss critical and emerging technologies, as well as encouragement from the leader level um, to increase cooperation among the three states technology companies. So um, spurring more industry collaboration, including semiconductor companies. In terms of existing and remaining hurdles in the technology and economic cooperation space, uh, while Chinese economic competition and coercion has certainly spurred progress in this area, um, if this momentum is not seized uh, and maintained, and if it's not actualized to shore up critical technology supply chains and build greater economic resiliency in the region, the China challenge could ultimately drive the three partners further apart once again, um, with Beijing prodding at different pain points for each state and breaking down their trust in each other and their belief in their shared strength. Um, and so in terms of specific hurdles, this looks like uh, some of the economic vulnerability that all three states have uh, in relation to China. All have felt the effects of Chinese economic coercion, um, but perhaps South Korea most acutely given how integrated they remain in Chinese markets. Um, and so navigating those different um, proximities to Chinese markets might be a difficult uh, hurdle going forward. And policymakers in particular in the three capitals will have to be careful um, in balancing the need for cooperation cooperative regional economic security um, in light of this sort of global pull towards protectionism that we're seeing across the board. Um, there's also the issue, as Evan mentioned, of sort of past uh, historical grievances resurfacing and playing out in the economic and technological domains, um, really wanting Japan and South Korea to avoid a repeat of the 2019 um, chemical trade dispute, which uh, obviously impacted the semiconductor industries in particular, um, but really uh, showed the vulnerability that historic um, grievances can have towards economic and technological competitiveness as well. Um, and then finally, as Evan mentioned, there's a number of minilateral and multilateral forms popping up to try and um, increase uh, discussion and increase connective tissue between the states and between other states in the region. I think time will tell um, how the U.S. and its allies and partners are able to mobilize these groups towards really actionable outcomes. Um, I know there's been uh, criticism around how um, effective CHIP4 can be given um, tensions around Taiwan's uh, engagement um, and then also struggles to get the IPEF um, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework uh, trade pillar off the ground has also been um, a pain point. So uh, those uh, mobilization issues remain uh, a problem, um, certainly going forward and, and one that we will need to tackle together. In terms of specific recommendations that we came up with in the report around the technology and economic domains, um, we see a lot of potential in collaborating um, more on quantum information science technology. My former colleague, now an adjunct fellow, uh, adjunct associate fellow with CNAS, Sam Howell, has done a lot of work in this space and looked specifically at dynamics between these three states. But there's a lot of uh, overlap and ambition and improficiency in the quantum space, and that should really be capitalized. Um, also looking at launching potentially a trilateral biotech industry working group um, to begin negotiations on a trilateral biotechnology cooperation agreement. Um, again, there's just a lot of overlap between ambition and proficiency, and, and there's a lot of room for expanded cooperation, um, leveraging each other's strengths and mitigating each other's shared weaknesses in that sector. And then finally, as I already touched on, um, working to build more consensus both at home in the United States um, and then also with, with counterparts um, in the region around that Indo-Pacific uh, economic framework trade pillar, which um, holds a lot of promise, but there remains a lot of work to be done to get that uh, off the ground and to get agreement around what that might look like. So um, we'll stop there, but uh, excited to dig into these a bit later. And um, yeah, really enjoyed working on this report with you both. Wonderful. Thank you both, Hannah and Evan, for really rich and comprehensive comments on the report. Hopefully it's sparked everybody's interest to take a look at the report and, and read it. We often hear about the defense uh, cooperation, um, the things that Evan talked about, um, not so much on the technology issue. So uh, really interesting to, to hear about all the opportunities on the technology front. 
Uh, with that, we're going to shift to our expert panel for their comments on the report. And we are very honored to have with us two very distinguished experts. Uh, we have Dr. Duyang Kim. Uh, Dr. Kim is an adjunct senior fellow with the Indo-Pacific Security Program at the NAS. Uh, she is based in Seoul, so she's talking to us today from Seoul. Uh, thank you for joining us. I think it's late in the evening there, but we appreciate you uh, taking the time. Uh, Dr. Kim's expertise includes the two Koreas, nuclear non-proliferation, arms control, East Asian relations and geopolitics, U.S. nuclear security policy and security. She is a columnist for the Bolton of the Atomic Scientist and a visiting professor at the Yonsei University Graduate School of International Studies, where she teaches regional security regimes in Europe and Asia, as well as deterrence and negotiations with North Korea, theory and practice. Um, next, we will have uh, Dr. Sheila Smith. Uh, she is the John E. Moreau Senior Fellow for Asia Pacific Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. She is an expert on Japanese politics and foreign policy. Uh, she has authored several books, uh, Japan Rearmed, The Politics of Military Power, Intimate Rivals, Japanese Domestic Politics and a Rising China, and Jap Japan's New Politics in the U.S.-Japan Alliance. So uh, extremely prolific. Uh, we're grateful she has the time to join us this morning. Um, and she also runs the CFR Interactive Guide to Constitutional Change in Japan. Uh, she's a regular contributor to the CFR blog, Asia Unbound, and also a frequent contributor to major media outlets in the United States and Asia. Uh, so with that, uh, Duyan, I will give you the floor. Well, thanks so much, Lisa. I really, to Lisa and Evan and Hannah, I really applaud you for an excellent report. Very comprehensive and detailed, great recommendations. Um, definitely highly recommend all of our members of the audience to really pick it up and read it in detail. Um, you know, Evan and uh, Hannah really also delivered uh, very good details of their findings and recommendations um, moments ago. And I, you know, I wanted to focus on one um, topic in particular, a factor in this equation, and that is politics and geopolitics. And this is this is a, a factor that's that's really important that determined, you know, why they. They, the three countries came together and will also potentially determine whether trilateral cooperation will be able to um, last beyond these three presidents. And so the Camp David summit and uh, subsequent trilateral cooperation that we're seeing today that Evan and Hannah um, shared with us, you know, these really are a testament that uh, the convergence of political wills and political capital can actually transcend a deep-seated historical animosity and bring countries together on shared challenges. But again, you know, lasting trilateral cooperation is still an uncertain prospect uh, where we might see leadership change, a leadership change in the United States. We're not sure with the presidential election. Um, there will be a leadership change in South Korea in 2027 and potentially one also in Japan with the prime minister. And so um, that's a big factor that, um, that could determine the future of trilateral cooperation. Operation. But this trilateral grouping is also innate, innately uh, fragile. Uh, and so that's another factor. And also Pyongyang and Beijing, they like to um, engage in what we call wedge driving tactics um, that try to drive wedges between different allies, the United, between the United States, South Korea, between the United States, Japan, even between South Korea and Japan. And so um, that could also potentially derail the hard work that's been put in by the governments today. Um, and so really, you know, the shared interests and common threats from North Korea and China were never really enough to bring these three countries together. And, and the Camp David trilateral summit and as well, and the trilateral cooperation that we're seeing right now, um, you know, th this really has all been made possible because of the unprecedented leadership and uh, political courage by Yoon, uh, President Yoon and Prime Minister Kishida uh, to begin resetting relations despite uh, criticism and skepticism at home, um, but also paired with 
with President Biden's diplomatic prowess in, in uh, really bringing his Asian allies together. Now, from a South Korean perspective, um, you know, who the president is is very important. Um, and the current president, Yoon, he, he had his uh, personal conviction to try to mend relations with Japan and put that into action. And this is something that um, none of his predecessors, even his not even none of the conservative predecessors were able to do uh, because it's been such a sensitive and unpopular issue. But Yoon was able to do this because he's an outsider conservative, not a party man. Uh, he does not have to really, um, you know, uh, be wary of of. Um, party politics uh, and what his his party uh, people and constituents really um, thought of him. So you know he he has never been a long time political, and I think that's really what was a determining factor of, of why and how he was able to put into action his conviction. Um, it, you know, and so it's really impressive. Our audience just heard um, Evan and Hannah lay it out. It's really comprehensive and all encompassing uh, what the three countries are doing. And, you know, especially on the security side, because I focus more on the security side, and I really, you know, was impressed with the hotlines and the deeper defense cooperation. But what I'd actually like to see them, the three countries, expand upon in defense cooperation is to um, try to even include military drills that involve scenarios, contingency scenarios involving or regarding uh, South China Sea, East, East China Sea, or even Taiwan, um, because the political will is there right now, even though this is still a very sensitive topic. Um, but the political will is there, which is so rare. So I hope these three countries can start to have that conversation and put it into action um, while we have these um, three presidents um, in office. And so again, you know, the future is very um, uncertain um, and, and it really will depend on who the presidents or the, the, the head of state will be in, in either of these three countries, um, given the, uh, the presidential election cycles coming up in each of these um, of countries. And, and with that, you know, I'm happy to expand further in, in the discussion, but I'll turn it back to you, Lisa. Great. And now we'll have Sheila. Sheila, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lisa. And it's great to be with Doyoung speaking to you about your report. And I want to congratulate Evan, Hannah, and you, Lisa, on a, on a really well-written, well-thought-out analytical report. Um, you know, there's lots of reports issued in Washington, as we all know, and I, I just wanted to to, to share with you my how impressive I thought this effort was. And so for those of you on the call listening, if you haven't had a chance to read it, you really should. It, it gives you an update on what's been happening, but I think analytically it's really quite profound. Um, so congratulations to, to you on that. I, you know, it's striking to me a couple of points in the general response to the, the report and the conversation on the trilateral, and we'll get into more detail, I think, in the Q&A with Lisa, but, um, you know, it, it, it strikes home. We sit in, I sit in Washington, and so we, we just assume that the U.S. matters. And I think one of the things that's really obvious here in this relationship is just how important it is for the United States to be constructive in thinking about innovations and new ways in which this trilateral can really shine. Um, we, we should pay attention to the foundational security commitments the United States has made to both of these allies. And so it's always important to, to put that first. But I think what's been really striking to me in watching the Biden administration, and again, this is highlighted in the report, is the process by which they have not only restored trust and confidence in the trilateral as a place to come together um, to, for, for shared goals and interests, but also has innovated. Um, and I think, again, um, Evan and Hannah put, pointed this out in their remarks, but I think it's been very interesting to watch the way in which um, the conversation between these three countries has really evolved. Now, the world, ha you know, the, the changes around the world helped because, as you know, the world is changing quickly and not necessarily in the interests of any of the three allies that we're talking about. Um, and that creates difficulty because not only do you have to think about the trilateral in its own terms and how do we continue the political will to continue to make this a strong partnership between Japan, South Korea, and the United States, but we also have to really change. Uh, we have to expand and adapt. And each of these alliances are going through moments of adaptation. You saw that when President Yoon came to Washington to talk about nuclear proliferation and how the U.S. 
and the, and the ROK would make sure that their ability to deter nuclear aggression on the peninsula was firm and solid. You're going to see in a week or two, Prime Minister Kishida coming to Washington uh, also to talk about ways with President Biden that the U.S.-Japan alliance is adapting to the changing environment. That, um, But the trilateral, that makes it a little bit harder. So it's not just that the trilateral is back on track. It's that the trilateral now has to be better <laughs> and more expansive. Uh, and I think that's a challenge. It's a serious, difficult problem. But I want to commend the Biden administration because I think they've managed it extraordinarily well. Um, second thing your report really highlights, and we can't say it enough, and Dion made this emphatic point in her presentation as well, leadership matters. This is a relationship where political will and political will at the highest level of all three governments has really rendered, um, I think, think, some real significant progress. This is not something that can be left to bureaucrats, although the bureaucrats are highly respected in all three countries, but it matters. And it mattered that President Yoon was willing to attend the G7 summit. It mattered that Prime Minister Kishida and President Yoon took the time in the context of that gathering to address the, the, the challenges that the publics in both countries see in the history of the two relationships. Um, so I think each of these leaders deserves an immense amount of credit, but I think this sustained high level summitry has been a very effective way of addressing what I think the publics have really wanted to be addressed, which is the political will for sustained engagement. Now, we'll talk later about what, what we think these political changes in each country um, ahead might mean for this. But I do feel that we talk a lot about institutionalization of the, of the partnership, the trilateral relationship, very important. Um, but if you don't have that high level leader engagement, I think it's hard uh, given the moment that we're in. So again, the report walks us through that uh, very, very well. Um, Finally, let me just point out something that's implicit in the report, but I just wanted to emphasize it because I was I, uh, I was glad to see it mentioned. And that is that this trilateral is not about each looking at each other, uh, but it's also about the way in which um, we have to think of this trilateral, not only in the Indo-Pacific, but also now more globally. And what I found has been really interesting to watch, and we can talk more about this later, is you know, a year earlier in 2022 in Phnom Penh, the trilateral made a very significant statement about how it was going to now refocus itself on the on the common goals for the Indo-Pacific. Um, and I think that was something very new. Uh, it was something I think President Yoon in particular came into office wanting to emphasize. Uh, it was something that was very much in line, obviously, with Prime Minister Kishida and the Japanese in interest in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, but it was new for the trilateral to take it not away from peninsular security, but to expand it to also think about this foundational role that this trilateral plays in the region. Um, more, more recently, and your report mentions the UN Security Council, and I'm glad for that. So I'm, I'm really happy to see that in there. Um, but the trilateral coordination also extends, obviously, to the United Nations when we think about the DPRK and nuclear proliferation, but it's also extended to a conversation about NATO and about what's been happening in uh, after in the wake of the Russian aggression against Ukraine. This is now a trilateral, and these three leaders have made it very clear, but it's a trilateral that also wants to sustain the liberal international order. And so you hear a lot of language about international law and the norms of the international order, but these are three countries, the United States, Japan, and South Korea, that have um, defined their post-war success uh, based on this international order. And so I think it's not just words, and it's not just rhetoric. I think it's very much a part of how the trilateral can gain some influence and can make itself heard in ways that individually it, it, it's harder to do, and even for the United States. So in fora, in Europe, in fora, in, in, in the United Nations, such as the United Nations, this is another area where I think the trilateral really matters and the current uh, level of sophistication and investment in by these leaders in this trilateral really helps in a broader context. So let me stop there, Lisa. Great. Thank you both so much. Uh, that really gave some rich context uh, for the trilateral, what's happening, what's happening in each country, and uh, you know what a historic opportunity uh, this really is. And I think you both emphasize that 
in your remarks. Um, so I'm going to uh, take the privilege of uh, being the moderator and pose a few questions to both uh, Dion and Sheila, but I want to make sure that the audience, uh, you know, you're going to have an opportunity to ask questions here in a few minutes. And so if you can uh, put your questions in the chat, um, we will get to those in just a few minutes. Um, but first, uh, Sheila, I'm going to turn to you first. So you talked a lot about um, the fact that, you know, the trilateral is expanding beyond the Korean Peninsula, that looking at the Indo-Pacific, even other regions of the world. Um, so I'd like to ask you, how do you think the trilateral fits in with other minilateral, multilateral groupings that are sort of proliferating uh, throughout the region? It's, it's sort of this new security architecture that's, that's evolving and, and coming up um, organically in some ways, but obviously, you know, all with sort of a, the same vision of preserving the the current uh, rules-based order. You have the CHIP4, uh, you have the US-Japan-Australia trilateral, uh, the Quad, uh, you know, many other groups. But how do you think this trilateral, it's, it's very new, but how do you think it will rank in terms of its likely impact on really fulfilling U.S. goals in the Indo-Pacific? So great, great question, Lisa. Thank you. I'm not sure um, I can do it justice, and I'd love to hear Dion's point of view on this. But but I think we shouldn't. I think we should remember that this trilateral is foundational to the peace and stability of Northeast Asia. So I don't come at this as this is a trilateral that should dip its toes into everything else that's happening. I think we have to start fundamentally from our commitment, our being the United States' is a commitment to our treaty allies. That's first and foremost, because our job is to deter aggression um, and, if necessary, to help our allies defend themselves in an increasingly volatile world. So, so we shouldn't forget that. I think diplomatically and increasingly technologically, which is, again, kudos to Evan and Hannah for the suggestions they make, we have new, uh, new avenues where each of the three countries can pursue their interests. We shouldn't assume that it's going to each of these will have equal attention in Seoul or Tokyo. Um, each of our allies will pursue opportunities, I think, as their interests dictate, and that's as it should be. So the CHIP 4 is tough work, as, as the Biden administration, we here in Washington know, it was not so easy and it continues to be a challenge. Um, but there's logical reasons for Seoul and Tokyo to want to shape U.S. policy on some of these initiatives as well. I wouldn't expect, for example, uh, South Korea to become a, a very strong um, partner in the U.S.-Japan-Philippine uh, evolving security relationship, for example. Uh, not high on the list, I believe, of Seoul's priorities. Um, but I think there's plenty of reason to think down the line for the, the U.S.-Japan-Australia-South Korean relationship may have some opportunities in Pillar 2 of AUKUS, for example, which is all about defense technology innovation. So I think we don't have to worry about competing minilaterals. I think we have to see, again, the foundational importance of the U.S.-Japan-South uh, Korea relationship and build it out from there as we go. South Korea and Japan both have deep interests in the agenda that the Quad has put forward. Now, do I think South Korea needs to be a member of the Quad? No, I don't. But I do feel that the working groups, and you and I have talked about this in different fora, the working groups that are developing out of the conversation in the Quad have ample room for South Korean participation and other actors' participation if and if they choose to, 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 to do that. And I think the UN administration has very, very clearly signaled their interest in resilient supply chains and other kinds of technological innovation there as well. So I don't know that, again, to, I don't see these as competing. And I think that there's ample room to find common cause between Tokyo, Seoul, and Washington in the many evolving conversations about economic as well as traditional security that we see today. That's great. Thank you. And thank you for mentioning um, some of the work CNAS has been doing on the Quad and Quad Plus. Um, I think, you know, we feel strongly that there does need to be a dialogue between the Quad and countries like South Korea, even if it's not, uh, you know, it's not as if South Korea is formally joining the Quad, but there should be um, dialogue because there's a lot of commonalities, common interests there. Uh, so thank you for mentioning that. Dion, did you want to add anything? 
Oh, well, I mean, just very quickly, I, I echo everything that Sheila said, and of course, Lisa, you as well, with the dialogue um, between South Korea and, and Quad. Um, you know, I, I definitely see the trilateral cooperation complementing the other minilaterals that the United States is spearheading, and I think it's a very good and necessary complement. Uh, to the other minilaterals, um, and just as you know, and Sheila said it far more eloquently. But it, you know, the, the trilateral really has a specific focus um, in this part of the region, and of course, they're, they're all, they are expanding outwards, of course, too. But um, you know, but it, but the strength and the interest where they really um, intersect and overlap really are in this sub-region part, the, the Northeast Asian uh, region of, of the Indo-Pacific region. And so I think that's an important one, um, you know, and, and of course, you know, South Korea, you know, the question about whether it should or should not join the Quad, I mean, that's really not, that really was never a question for South Korea to decide. Of course, we all know that um, the Quad members um, have to decide that. But I do remember uh, when the when the Quad was revitalized, um, there's a lot of debate and discussion here in South Korea. There's a lot of um, disagreements even on whether South Korea should ask to join or not. Um, and so we, it, it really was divided. But, there, but those who really saw um, merit and a point in whether it's joining, but but at the very least collaborating, I think it's really in South Korea's national interest to do that. Great, thank you. Okay, I have an, another question for both of you. Um, so both of you talked about the importance of political will and the leadership that has been shown in, in all three capitals um, to make this actually happen, given all the uh, historical um, issues between South Korea and Japan. Um, but of course, South Korea and Japan are watching very closely the U.S. presidential campaign. Um, what are the biggest concerns in each country uh, regarding the campaign itself, uh, which will you know, be going on the next seven or eight months, uh, as well as the potential outcomes of the, uh, the race itself? Uh, who wants to go first? Sheila, do you want to take that one? I will jump in. Um, you know, the whole world is watching this presidential election uh, with bated breath, um, to put it mildly. Um, and our allies, I think, first and foremost, this is an election, I think, the outcome of which will have significant consequences for the alliances that the United States has built in the post-war period. Um, maybe first and foremost in NATO and Europe, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't discount their. You know, whatever happens is going to affect both the U.S. Japan and U.S. ROK alliance. For Japan, I think there's a couple of things on the on the concern list, if I can put it that way. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Prime Minister Kishida will be here on uh, April 10th and 11th uh, for a state visit with President Biden. Um, it pained, I think, the, the Japanese prime minister and the Japanese private sector in particular to hear him mention uh, the Nippon Steel acquisition of U.S. Steel. Um, and not so much that it, there is any resistance at all to the CFIUS pro process of investigating and, and, and examining foreign purchases of U.S. Um, uh, companies and, and capabilities, private sector capabilities. That's not a problem, obviously. And I think Nippon Steel felt that their deal would 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 bear that scrutiny. I think what's more worrisome is um, the political, the insertion of politics into into this about whether or not trade is 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 still what the United States is interested in, whether or not the U.S. market is open to foreign investment. And um, I think you know. Candidate Trump, former President Trump, has made it his business to condemn the deal, but also to speak more broadly on, you know, imposing 60% tariffs across the board on on trade with the, with with the world. Um, that obviously worries the Japanese. Um, the Japanese Japanese companies are the, the first, depending on the exchange rate of the moment, either first or second uh, highest foreign direct investment sources uh, for the United States and creator of, of almost a million jobs here in this country. Uh, so this would also, I imagine, worry South Korea too. But, so that's one. The second, very briefly, is the burden sharing question. And um, Japan uh, did, was lucky. Uh, South Korea was not so lucky, but Japan was lucky in the first Trump administration uh, because its host nation support negotiations did not occur until the very end of the the Trump administration. So it didn't really come under serious negotiating scrutiny about how much money the Japanese government would pay 
for U.S. forces stationed there. Uh, South Korea did, and, and it was a tough conversation to have. Should there be a change, I think uh, you would see a, a Trump administration come back into office with both that focus on charging our allies more for U.S. military presence, but also a very different approach perhaps to the Korean Peninsula, which would make Japan very worried about deter its own deterrence, but also the, the way in which the United States would fulfill its role to both allies in Northeast Asia. Great, Diane. Yes, so topping um, the list would be South Korean concerns that a President Trump uh, might withdraw US troops from the Korean Peninsula. And so if that happens, um, then it will likely spike feelings of insecurities and, and anxiety and feelings of abandonment here in South Korea, uh, which could then incentivize South Korean conservatives in particular, but perhaps even moderates, uh, to demand their country that their own country produce its own nuclear weapons. Um, but the irony of this is that the same conservatives um, would see Trump's election as an opportunity for their country to go nuclear because he had once said during the last presidential campaign that he would be okay with South Korea and Japan going nuclear. And so um, if this scenario does play out the way that this, you know, worst case scenario that I've just described, um, then, you know, the implication would be um, the potential for a nuclear arms race in Northeast Asia, because if, and that's a big if, but it, but if South Korea does in the future decide or is really tempted to go nuclear, then um, it could um, incentivize Japan and maybe even Taiwan. We're not sure about Taiwan anymore, but um, and then of course, if you know South Korea Japan act, then China of course um, would not sit still. And so um, that's one concern. Another concern here in South Korea um, that South Koreans would have is um, if Trump decided to cut a deal with North Korea and um, Sheila alluded to this a bit, um, that he might cut a deal with Kim Jong-un that did not include South Korean considerations or a deal that would disadvantage South Korea across the board, um, including its national security. And, and the, the other top concern that many South Koreans would have is exactly what Sheila mentioned, and that is on the issue of burden sharing, that, that Trump would demand far more, uh, that South Korea pay far more than it already does um, to, to host uh, US troops. Well, thank you both. Uh, you've made me nervous, uh, but I think, you know, a couple things um, that we should keep in mind, you know, obviously we look back uh, at the previous Trump administration when we contemplate uh, whether or not he, he might come back as president again. But we also have to remember, you know, he learned a lot during those four years. And also things have changed in both Korea and Japan. Um, Korea is paying more for the U.S. troops. Uh, than it was initially when Trump first came to office. Um, and with regard to Japan, Japan uh, has you know, committed to increasing its own defense budget for taking more responsibility for deterrence and security in the Indo-Pacific. So I think all of these things have sort of uh, reshaped the environment and so that you know, we should expect that there would be some different approaches um, potentially in the new Trump administration. Um, but I do have a couple more questions and I, I wanna um, get to the audience questions as well in a few minutes. But first, Duyan, I'd like to ask you, you have asserted that the outcome of the April 10 National Assembly elections in South Korea will not impact President Yoon's commitment to the trilateral dialogue and improving the bilateral relations with Japan. Um, I wonder if you could explain this a bit further because it goes against conventional wisdom, um, which would be that if the ruling party would uh, fare poorly in the National Assembly elections, that could lead President Yoon to shy away from politically risky moves that may not have broad public buy-in, like you know, making concessions or further improving relations with Japan. So could you explain that a little bit more? Yes, that's a great question. So I don't think that Yoon himself, that his commitment would not change because, or I think his commitment would not change because the opposition party right now, the progressives, they already have a super majority in the National Assembly right now. Um, and because it's been his, and it's been Yoon's uh, personal conviction and goal to improve relations with Japan and strengthen both the alliance relationship with the United States, but also 
uh, trilateral cooperation. Um, you know, we have also seen his personality over the past couple of years uh, be such that he may even bulldoze through foreign policies that he has set his mind on. Uh, and South Korean foreign policies generally do not require national assembly approval. Now, all of this said, however, uh, there is one caveat and possible variable in this equation. Um, you know, the general thinking right now here in Seoul, we're about two weeks away from the general elections, is that Yoon may immediately become a lame duck after the national assembly elections, regardless of whether uh, his ruling party wins or not. And that's because the country, including his own party, will be focused on preparing for the 2027 presidential elections. Uh, and South Korea's constitution does not allow a president to run for re-election. So they only get one term. Mm -hmm. uh, so if every, so if, for example, in this caveat scenario, if everyone's focused on 2027 politically, both politically and the constituents and everybody across the board, then even if Yoon himself is committed, I think he will be himself, but even if he's committed to try a lot of cooperation, it could really depend on whether the bureaucrats or the worker bees in government feel the need to continue to implement these initiatives at the same level as they are right now, especially if uh, the National Assembly cuts budgets or if officials feel that the domestic political environment is unstable until 2027. So um, in this scenario, it may actually come down to Yoon's leadership again, but domestic leadership now, and whether he's able to inspire or incentivize his government officials to continue to implement trilateral cooperation. Um, but even in, but even this scenario could have other variables that are unforeseen right now and could surface after the National Assembly elections in about two weeks. Really interesting, thank you. Um, Sheila, my last question uh, goes to you. So uh, Kim Jong-un recently said Japan has reached out for bilateral leader level talks. Um, and you know it's likely that he's trying to disrupt the US-Japan-Korean trilateral cooperation, finds that threatening. Um, what is the likelihood that the three nations will remain in lockstep over how to deal with the DPRK. Uh, will Prime Minister Kishida's uh, declining domestic popularity influence his decision-making on North Korea? Um, or what are some of the other developments that could potentially weaken the trilateral collaboration on how to manage the DPRK nuclear and missile challenge? So we can have a whole panel discussion on that issue all by itself. So let me try to be very, very brief. Um, for your listeners who don't know, Kishida will face a leadership election for the party uh, in September. So that's why we're talking about Mr. Yes. Kishida and perhaps a post-Kishida moment. Um, and in and, and his approval rating, as you noted, has not been stellar. Uh, it looks a little bit like President Biden's, to be honest. It has stuck fairly, fairly low during the time of his office, despite his diplomatic and strategic accomplishment, policy accomplishments. Um, so you could have somebody new come in from the party uh, to take over the helm. And that would then, of course, uh, lead to a general election. And, and we would still have conservative government in Japan. Uh, but how much of a mandate that government would have remain would, would be up for grabs. Um, this is the difference, again, this is a structural difference between Japan and South Korea. South Korea, like us, is a presidential system. And so the dynamics that Dion was explaining so well um, are different in Japan. We will have conservative leadership in Japan, without a doubt. Whether we have somebody who's able to mobilize their party and their, their government uh, remains to be seen. She has been uh, actually fairly effective, even if he hasn't gotten political credit for it. Um, on the DPRK, I would imagine that your assessment that this is uh, Kim Jong-un trying to muddy the waters a little bit, I think that's a pretty fair assessment. Uh, that's the only thing to me that explains why Kim Jong-un would want to have a bilateral conversation with Tokyo at this particular moment. Uh, as you know, in the past, bilateral diplomacy between Tokyo and, and Pyongyang has never been successful outside the context of a broader engagement. Um, you know, the Koizumi visits of the early 2000s was the one moment where you saw actually pretty significant and innovative Japanese diplomacy, but it redounded badly at home because Kim Kim Jong-un's father uh, revealed the abductees, that there were actually abducted Japanese living still in, in, in North Korea, and the backlash inside Japan has been tremendous on that. So there's a lot, there's not a lot of latitude that a Japanese government, whether led by Kishida or anybody else, there's not a lot of latitude there uh, in Japan for really a breakthrough diplomatic effort with Pyongyang, absent, of course, 
Soul and Washington's um, concurrence. Um, but I think so abductees, the P Pyongyang has never successfully addressed Japanese concerns about potential remaining Japanese who are alive or who may have died in North Korea. Um, the missile tests uh, that your report mentions and, and, and that you've mentioned in the introduction as well have largely been in the direction of Japan or over Japanese territory. Again, a major focal point for Japanese security. And then finally, this new relationship between Russia and the DPRK. Uh, is fundamentally problematic for Japan. And Japan has come out with the G7 countries to condemn Russia's aggression in Europe. Uh, the Russians have put military pressure on Japan in the north, increasingly uh, sort of reminding the Japanese that they can complicate any kind of Japanese defense effort should they choose to, but also teaming up with China to exercise in and around northern Japan to signal to, to Tokyo that, that Russia uh, sees Japan as potentially a problem. So I think the Russian DPRK uh, conversation about new technological um, cooperation by Moscow to help Kim Jong-un's efforts, right? To, to, to move in the direction of a, a usable and sustainable nuclear arsenal. I think you are going to find the Japanese will firmly uh, you know, decry any kind of diplomacy with Pyongyang that doesn't take into account what that actually means for their security. So I don't see this as an opening that we should be very worried about to put it in those terms. I do don't think that Seoul should be worried about it. Uh, because Japanese have, the Japanese have zero interest in making a compromise with Kim Jong-un. Um, but I think it's interesting. And it's an interesting example of just how fluid the diplomacy in Northeast Asia is and, and beyond. So I think we should pay close attention. And Tokyo is consulting closely with Seoul and with Washington on, on this recent overture by Kim Jong-un. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, with that, we'll turn to some of our audience questions. We have a few minutes and we have a few questions. So um, I'm going to bring back in um, Hannah and Evan for the Q&A portion. Uh, welcome back, the two of you. Um, so the first question comes from Mindy and she asks a great question. She says, in researching the report, was there discussion of how the women, peace and security agenda fits into reforming the Japan-Korea relationship, which of course is important legislation that was passed, I believe back in 2017, uh, to make sure that gender equity is included in US foreign policy, particularly with regard to conflict resolution, peace building, peacemaking. Um, so this is a really, really great uh, question when talking about uh, Japan-Korea relations. Um, does anybody want to take a stab at that? Um, if if, if uh, anybody wants to think about, um, you know, I, I guess the question would be maybe uh, for us, the report authors. Um, and I, I think this is a, a great question because, uh, you know, the issue of gender equity is important. And, you know, when we're talking about uh, the peninsula and the, the tensions there, um, potential for conflict, um, trying to work together more to prevent that conflict. Um, I think it is an apt question uh, to talk about, you know, the involvement of women in those discussions and, in, you know, ensuring that um, the issue of women is something that we're, you know, putting as a high priority uh, you know, I think this is definitely something that, that should be there and something that we should pay attention to. It's not something, obviously, that our report dived into, but, you know, I think it's something for the, in the future, we can really look at that because this is important legislation that was passed. It does apply across the globe. Uh, so it certainly should apply when we're talking about um, U.S., Japan, Korea cooperation to deter and prevent a conflict. Um, on the Korean Peninsula or or otherwise. Um, Evan, Hannah, do you want to say anything more on that? Yeah, I'm happy to tag in on this. Um, as you mentioned, it's not something that necessarily made it in as a prominent feature of our report, 
um, and looking at sort of the cadence of action that's been taken recently and then where we see um, some of the, the broader geopolitical context going. But I think it is always an underlying feature of our conversations and our considerations. Um, the reality is that um, uh, part of that uh, agenda, part of that law that was passed is uh, in part about U.S. Um, sort of modeling that transformation and modeling that incorporation of, of more women's voices in these discussions. And I think that that modeling, um, again, will feature into this broader uh, cadence of meetings that have been taking place and hopefully will continue to take place. I think it's going to be a constant reinforcement of having women at the table, U.S. women at the table, uh, specifically turning to the Japanese and Korean women at the table and asking their opinions and making sure that they are um, they are heard as well. Um, but just encouraging sort of a, a mindset shift in those conversations to make sure that we aren't tokenizing women by pulling them in, but we're making sure that it's just a given that we are listening to all voices. Um, and so certainly something that I think we should consider more deeply in, in future reports, but um, was not not an afterthought in this one for sure. Great, okay, thank you. The next question comes from David. Um, how can we sustain the positively improving trilateral relationship when administrations in all three countries change? How can we institutionalize trilateral cooperation and minimize the impact of political change, um, which of course will always affect the cooperation? Um, so we got into this a little bit, but um, do any of you have anything to add on how we can really institutionalize this uh, trilateral cooperation? Sheila, Dion? I can say something briefly, Lisa. Yes. I, just, I, I think the the strategy the Biden administration has put forward for this, and this is a, de this is a deliberate effort, and I think it's a good one, um, and supported in both Tokyo and Seoul. But it is the more that you can rebuild trust and confidence and regularize consultations across the board, the more that will become second nature. So in some ways, the longer this can go on uh, under the current um, under the current leadership, I think the, the more likelihood that this will have legs as it goes forward. Political change, you know, we, we're seeing the same thing. I don't know if you agree with me, Lisa, but I think we're seeing the same thing in the quad. Um, the more leaders meetings to have, the more uh, institutionalized cooperation and, and, and you get in newer initiatives, um, the longer, the more, the more steady and accepted that cooperation is going to be. People will pick up the phones to in, consult with each other naturally, as opposed to thinking that's an odd uh, way to, to do business. So I, I just think institutionalization takes time. And, and that's what I think it needs in this instance as well. Yeah, I think you're right about the building habits of cooperation, which we hear Kurt Campbell talk about a lot with regard to the quad. Um, I do think the trilateral is a bit more complicated given some of the historical baggage between South Korea and Japan and how that plays into the politics um, in each country. Uh, but uh, I think it, that raises a great point. The more meetings you can have, uh, the more you could just keep doing together, uh, the stronger foundation you build. And the more each country sees how the trilateral cooperation impacts positively its own uh, security and, and benefits its own country. Um, I would like to try to get to the, the, um, the other question we have here. It's a good one. Uh, this is from Serena. You've mentioned the defense and technology buckets of the relationship. But what about defense technology cooperation? Do you have any perspectives for how to enhance dual use tech research in particular for the trilat? Um, I'd like to turn to Evan uh, first on this question. Evan? Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, I think this is a fantastic question. Um, we were asking this 20, 30 years ago. I think it would be a very different answer. We've come from a place where the government used to fund 90 plus percent of all R&D and research for these kinds of endeavors. But we're now in an era where not only is the defense industry quite globalized now, but most of the R&D that's taking place on these issues is taking place in the private sector. So. I think this is a unique case where it's more about pushing on an open door and letting commercial lead the way in a lot of ways when it comes to these initiatives. And within the context of the trilateral, uh, we've actually seen a few initiatives where uh, the South Korean government has engaged with Japanese business. Uh, President Yoon has visited with um, Japanese business leaders and then both Prime Minister Kishida and President Yoon engage with business leaders in Silicon Valley during the APEC summit. And so I think in a lot of cases, it's just a matter of 
letting uh, commercial go first, and then on top of that, within the context of the trilateral, letting uh, Japan yeah. and South Korea um, really take the lead on this, particularly for for Japan. The context, right, is that traditionally their their export controls have been quite limited uh, when it comes to a lot of these issues. Um, that's very recently changed. Uh, we're seeing collaboration with the UK and Italy on on the Tempest uh, six gen fighter program. Uh, we're seeing collaborations with the Australian Ministry of Defense. There's there's a lot of updates in that front. Um, but that said, I think because uh, traditionally Japan and South Korea have had a, a bit more restrictions on this front than uh, the U.S., I think it's best to let them lead the way on this front. So, great question, definitely worth a, a report in itself. <laughs> great. Okay. Uh, I guess you've chalked out your next uh, research area, Evan. Um, do we have any other comments from any any other speakers on, if, on that question? Yeah, if I can go back to the previous, and this also kind of ties into a little bit to what Evan just said, but on the institute institutionalization question, um, uh, Lisa, you, you took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say habits of cooperation. Um, and that term has, of course, Kirk Campbell is talking about it, but that term has been used a lot by go, dating back to Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice uh, when they designed the six party talks under the Bush administration. They, they believe that if the six countries, the two Koreas, uh, the U US, China, Japan and Russia, if they cooperated for enough years um, in the six-party process over North Korea's nuclear weapons program, then they, they could build habits of cooperation that will then expand into other areas, not just North Korean nuclear issues. Um, and so that, of course, you know, I, I think definitely doing more and at frequent is, is it would help, but I still can't help but go back to the question and the factor and variable of politics, political will and political, ca political capital really were the um, deciding factors this time for this trilateral. Uh, and so even if the three countries right now until maybe November or January in the United States, um, even if they, they you know race forward to as many and frequent and high and low across the board um, contacts, you know, if the political will and political capital are not there, then I just um, don't see See how this trilateral can can last, and we do have um, a, a recent um, such a case where that happened, where you know the the U.S. South Korea, Japan, in 1999, they established the Trilateral Cooperation Oversight Group, um, but then it, it crumbled in the early 2000s because of divergent views on how to approach North Korea, for example. And so um, I think it, it, it's complicated, it's complex. You know, I really do hope they continue. I really do hope they, the habits of cooperation really do solidify so that they can run on autopilot. But I am cautious because of the whole factors of political will and politics that could play put out. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. I think that's a, a great point to end on. Um, we're optimistic, but we we go into this with our eyes wide open. So there's a certain amount of caution as well. Um, but I want to thank all of our speakers today. Um, great discussion. And I also want to thank all of you in our audience uh, for listening today. And until next time, uh, wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you.